Good morning, kids. Most of you are kids from GS. Um, I'm feeling good talking here in front of children, but you look. And uh, I'm not sure what type of audience we will have here, and so this makes my task a little easy. You will understand what I'm going to be talking about. For many of you, this is a familiar picture. A little bit blurred, but familiar. And uh, you'll know that they have these fancy ropes and all that stuff there. This is some convocation program going on. What is the trouble here? The trouble is that these young men and women are holding a candle in one hand and they have a scroll in the other hand. That's not usual in a convocation ceremony. That confusion is like this blurred picture. You don't know what's going on. It is a small part of a big picture. This is clear to most of you. This is the main lecture theater at the GS Medical College, and you are aware of this. This is the convocation ceremony for passing out students of MBBS. In front of their proud parents and sometimes grandparents, these children take the Hippocratic Oath, which is usually administered to them by a GSI. Some five or four or five years back, I had this privilege of uh, administering this oath to them. Over a period of two or three minutes, I read out something, and dutifully this, but you look, you don't mind my saying that, repeated that uh, after me. The program got over, and I was on top of the world, in the sense that what more privilege can a next faculty have than, the administ than administer the Hippocratic Oath to students from your own alma mater? It's a big deal. I did not think much about the Hippocratic Oath at that time, but on my way back in the evening, I was mulling over this and I said, what are these children saying again and again in the Hippocratic Oath? And then it came to me, a very simple thing, they said, I'll be a good doctor. You go round and round and keep saying, I will be a good doctor. And I said, good doctor? What do you mean by good doctor? What does that adjective in that phrase mean? And I said, there is no point in asking medical guys who is a good doctor. So I went home and then I devised a Google uh, survey form and I sent it off to about a thousand of my friends, most of them non-medical guys, a few medical students, a few medical faculty, and after a few days, I got responses from about 60, sorry, 600 people. That's about 60%, right? I hope my math is right. And they said several things. And I'll show you this difficult to write, uh, difficult to read slide. Don't bother your head with trying to read this. They gave all sorts of things and tried to tabulate. And I make it simple for you. This is what they said at the end. A majority of them, I think close to 70% or so, he said the obvious, a good doctor is one who is concerned about the welfare of the patient. Easy, A plus B, A into B is AB, simple. But about 50%, am I right? About 60% said a good doctor is one who treats the patient as a human being. That surprised me. The doctor hopefully is a human being, the patient is a human being, and what do you expect one be human being to do to another human being? treat the patient as a human being. The fact that 60% of them said the doctor who treats a, fellow pa treats a patient as a human being is a good doctor, there is something missing. They are not sure all the time that the doctor is treating the patient as a human being. We need to ponder about that. And I did think about this a lot. And I said, to find an answer to this question, we have to go back into medical education and see how doctors are born from medical students. You enter the medical school at the age of 18, you're just beginning your life as an adult, and then you come out at 25, a qualified doctor with a license to do whatever you want to your patients. If you are in a medical institution, a teaching hospital, which is like the GS Medical College and the KM Hospital, they are huge, humongous structures which have heavy, heavy loads of patients. For example, the GS Medical College handles about 19 million outpatients each year. So these are fertile grounds to learn. But a medical student who comes of anatomy, dissection, pathology, slides, and pharmacology, mug it up, has to see these patients 
And the first response is, oh my God. <laughs> Outpatient clinics are crowded. And what, does it, what happens? And he sees that his senior colleagues are sitting and being swarmed by outpatients from outside. And in fact, the situation is so bad that there has to be a security guard out there guarding the entrance to the doctor's cabin so that there is not overcrowding. These are something that will completely daunt a bag, brand new 20-year-old medical student. But this is reality. These are large staging hospitals which provide almost complete service with almost complete no charge for these patients. And naturally, in a city like Bombay, or for that matter, any city in our country, they are crowded. Crowded swarms of patients, a whole load of human suffering all around surrounding them. That's a big psychological load. Forget about emergency days, forget about 36-hour shifts, forget all that. It is huge psychological burden. So you finish off your outpatient clinics, and then you venture into the wards. Oh my god, another ward day. The boss is going to kill me, right? You go into these wards and there are ro rows and rows of patients, more patients, more patients. You select a patient, this is my patient, take the history, do the examination and present it in front of the boss. Yeah? You're trying to think which, which clinic should I bunk? Not easy, because all clinics are important. What I'm trying to say is that being a medical student is not easy. It is both physical burden and emotional burden because you are young and you are exposed to human suffering all around you. And then the clinic, the actual clinic, the boss is standing around with his whole team of the unit there and you are presenting your case in front of them. Some bosses are friendly and they say, okay, doesn't matter, you made a mistake, carry on. Others are complete pathological specimens who are waiting to pounce on you and catch your every single mistake and then say at the end of the term, repeat. <laughs> the dreaded word, repeat. But all that happens and all that I'm saying is that it is a lot of practical work that you handle with tons and tons of patients. A great opportunity to learn, but a great situation in which you get overwhelmed by the patient load that you see. And then what happens? One day you are in final year and you are assigned a particular patient you s and you are told do this dressing, do this suture removal, get the pathology report from pathology, collect the x-ray report from there. There is one patient for you. And that patient happens to be non-healing ulcer in the left foot and bed number 40. It becomes an anonymous patient, bed number 40. That's how you grow by. Anonymity, the only name that the patient has is bed 40. God forbid the bed is changed and you're in trouble. You know something about the patient? Nothing. Except that he has a non-healing ulcer on the foot and you have to do the dressing day after day. Oh my God, dressing day after day. The anonymity of the patient creeps in as a necessity of the workload under which you are trained. I'm not saying this happens all the time. I'm sure there are institutions which train the bachus separately, differently, but it is near universal. We grow up on that culture of anonymity. And so it happens that one of these pediatric wards has loads and loads of bachus. I mean, not medical students, I mean real bachus. And one morning, and this is real life story, okay, I'm not bluffing. My radiology resident, I was thinking I should explain who a resident is, but to this crowd, I need not explain. A postgraduate student in radiology shows me a film, and before that she says, this is a three-year-old male child. Think about this, three-year-old male child. Why don't you say three-year-old boy? This is the case of a three-year-old male child. Think back and wonder. The patient has a name. He's not a male child. He is a boy. We never do that. Three-year-old male child. No name, no nothing. Because anonymity and distance comes into that. And she said, this male child has presented with intractable cough. You know what the intractable means, yeah? 
day in and night out for the last four days. The question that I asked, any fever? And she said, and it was she, right? And she said, no, sir, no fever. And I've mentally made up my diagnosis of what is likely to be intractable cough in a three-year-old child and no fever. I sort of know what that is. I'm not going to ask you questions. Don't worry. <laughs> and this was the chest film that was shown to me. And if there are non-medical guys here, for your sake, this is a film as if the patient is looking at you. So that your right is the patient's left. And the stuff that is white in between the left lung and the right lung is the heart. And I'll tell you why it's so important that we have a heart, yeah? And if you can see, I'm not, I'm not sure you can see it well enough in this lighted situation. You know, radiologists always work in the heart, in the dark, and they keep everybody in the dark, no matter. <laughs> so you can see very clearly that the left lung is blacker than the right lung, yeah? Some of you may not be able to see it very clearly. Why is that so? That is because there is a heart in between, yeah? I keep saying this, the heart comes in the way of all sorts of rational decision making. <laughs> so you get rid of the heart. Now if you get rid of the heart, and even first MBBS students if they are here can say that the left lung is blacker than the right lung. So in this clinical setting of cough, 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 no fever, and black lung on one side and normal lung on the other side, you think of this as a foreign body in the left main bronchus, somewhere on the left side. Yeah, this is like four-legged animal outside, outside Tata Hospital is most likely to be a dog. Yeah, not a zebra. So this is a foreign body in probably on the left side definitely, but maybe in the left main bronchus. So she showed me this and I said, what did you diagnose? So that was at 8 p.m. the previous evening. And she said, now this sir business, anybody who is more than six years, six months older than you in medical language, yes sir or ma'am. So she said, sir, I thought this was a left main bronchus foreign body. I told this to the pediatric surgery resident. They had a look at the chest film and they took up the patient for bronchoscopy. Yeah, bronchoscopic removal. Then the obvious question, what happened? Follow up, no? What happened? And this lady, you know, there is a reputation in KEM radiology that the resident doctors get follow up on their patient sitting outside the kata in the canteen. <laughs> That's their follow up. So this lady knew that I knew that she may be doing it. So she pro provided evidence. She said, sir, I followed up this patient and this is what they found. In the left main bronchus. Now this stuff is called, if you're speaking American, it's called a peanut. If you're speaking English, it has got a ground nut. No matter. There was a peanut or a ground nut in the left main bronchus that was removed bronchoscopically and the patient is fine. It's like magic. The cough disappeared. Sorry, cough disappeared. Everything is all right. And everybody lived happily ever after. That's what I thought. And this lady, amazing lady, completely amazing. She said, sir, I have some more pictures for you. I said, okay post bronchoscopic chest x-ray to rule out maybe a pneumothorax or whatever and she showed me this film. She said, sir, I found this picture so moving that without taking permission from the patient, I clicked this x-ray. And she said, I feel this is like a human shield for the baby. For the first time in days, the mother and the child have had a peaceful night's sleep. I said, that's very good. I compliment you for being so sensitive. Thank you, please get back to your work. This is eight in the morning, please get back to your work. She said, no sir, I got one more picture. I said, what's this? She said that the boy is the, old, is the brother of the girl inside and the girl who's sleeping is the younger brother of that girl one generation ahead, one generation below, and this boy is taking care of this kid just because the mother is sitting inside. Even I was moved. After so many years of hardened medical <laughs> education, so much of experience in our teaching hospital, even I was moved. Then I said, very good, you've done a great job. I, I really appreciate your sensitivity in this matter. And then before she left the room, I said, 
what do you make of all this experience? And she said this, and I'll never forget it. And she is, uh, she has not given me permission to give her name, but she is now in, neuro, in Canada doing a neuroradiology program or whatever. But this is what she said. And she was a kid at that time, maybe 25, 27, 28 years old. We cured, they cared. And I thought about that and said, why can't it be the other way around? We cured and we cared. Why has it to be like we cured, they cared? You know, the trouble with medical science, I believe, is that we are very good technologically. We can look at the brain of a patient in real time and see which part of the brain is working when. You jiggle your toes, etc., etc. That's possible. But we do not have the art of looking into the mind of a patient and addressing that with the most technologically advanced structure in the human body, the human hand. The human hand on the shoulder of a patient and say, don't worry, we will take care of you. We can do functional MR, look at the brain, we need to learn how to look at the mind of the patient and fix that too. William Osler, all of you, if you are a medical student here, please look up William Osler. Please read his book, Ikwan and Mitas. It's available in the GS library. And a great teacher and a great surgeon who said this, don't look at the disease, look at the patient. And that is the theme of what I'm trying to say here. And this book by Kitzman talks about patients talking about doctors who have been sick and they talking about their relationship with sickness. A psychiatrist himself, he studied, he suffered from depression and he says this, for the first time in my life, I've been treating patients with depression. I know what actually it is to be depressed. And this is there outside the telephone exchange in the GS Medical College, Robert Hutchison. You must be reading his book on clinical science in medicine. Yeah? If you're not reading it, you're going to flunk your MBBS exam. <laughs> and he said many, many things in this. And he said, putting uh, science before art. There is always a debate. Is it an art or a science? And like most things in life, the truth is somewhere in between. Putting science before art. Many of you will not recognize this picture. This is of a patient. You're looking at the skull frontal view. And something is there, black, black stuff like worms, outside the skull on the right side. You show it in an interventional neuroradiology program, everybody will stand up and applaud. What a brilliant job of embolization. It looks brilliant when you look at the embolization done. You are looking at an image. You look at the patient who has that image. Look at this whole facial expression of this little girl. We always say a picture is worth a thousand words. This is worth a trillion words. Let's look at this. Let's not look at just the disease that the patient has, but let's also look at the, the patient who has the disease. We have the right brain and the left brain. One thinks like a mathematical machine, the other has emotions. We use technology to use both of these or one of these oftentimes. I believe we need to find a balance between the two. The art of medicine and the science of medicine. We should not just cure, and like my lady resident said, we should also care. Let's break patterns of what we have been doing for so long and create change. Let's have the courage to wipe that tear away. Thank you.